Hi everyone, my name is Anya, and today I'm going to be talking about what I learned about writing from Aaron Morgenstern's novel, The Starless Sea. So I love reading fantasy. I write fantasy novels, um, and I thought that Morgenstern did a lot of really cool and interesting and unique things in this novel um, to create a really distinctive voice, a very engaging story, um, and I thought a lot of those things I could apply to my own writing, and hopefully you can too. So let's get started. I think Morgan Stern does a really great job of setting expectations from the get-go. Now, this might seem like a pretty weird thing to say, I guess, given that Morgan Stern's books are infamous for being confusing and convoluted and uh, pretty complicated, um, but she does this thing that I call reserving confusion. Um, and what I mean by that is that she makes sure that readers are never confused about the trivial things. She reserves their confusion for things that are important symbolically or emotionally um, or just really significant to the book in general because there's only so much confusion that a reader can have before they just like throw up their hands don't read your book anymore and Maureen Zorn makes sure that she doesn't waste this small amount of confusion on really trivial things um, like the time and the place so we'll see examples of that later um, but I think that that's one of the really important things that she does in order to make this really long novel uh, successful. So take a look at the first six section titles from The Starless Sea. And you can see that number four, January 2015, that's where we first meet our main character by name, Zachary Ezra Rollins, and Morgan Stern starts out this section by stating his name, um, and she does that for every single one of the sections that he narrates. Um, and by doing this, she makes sure that readers always know when they're in a section that is in his narration. And that becomes important because, as you can see, the sixth section, she doesn't give a title, but she starts out with his name, Zachary Ezra Rollins, and immediately the reader knows what to expect, where they are, who's narrating. But the thing is, in the last sections of the book, she actually breaks this pattern. Instead of saying his name, Zachary, she says, the son of the fortune teller. And because she set such a strong expectation and a pattern in the preceding sections, the reader is immediately attuned to this change, and I think both of these both of these titles his name and the son of the fortune teller really clearly set set up his position and his role and when the one that Morgan Stern uses changes you immediately think oh how has his role changed how what does that mean for this section and i think that's a really good way of grabbing people's interest for that section so you can see that uh, four of these titles start with the phrase sweet sorrows and that's actually the name of a book within the book and then in part two of the novel, uh, we get a lot of sections called Fortunes and Fables, which come from a book called Fortunes and Fables, obviously. <laughs> um, and this is another case where Maureen Stern sets really clear expectations. So basically, she labels what you're going to see, whether it's an excerpt from Fortunes and Fables or Sweet Sorrows or various other books within the book that we see later on. And so you're never like, oh, why is there like a random excerpt from this book, Sweet Sorrows? You always know because the section has been titled that, and now you're getting those excerpts. So again, setting expectations. I think that by titling each section, each larger section of the book this way, uh, Morgan Sir makes sure that her changes in format and storytelling like mode never feel forced. They always are expected. And what's more, all of these section titles correspond to books within the book or ways of storytelling, ways of conveying information, which is just so cool for a book that like one of the, where one of the thematic subjects is storytelling and how stories are told and passed on and uh, retold. And I think, again, it's especially important for a really long book, the fact that the themes and the format or the, the section titles are all tied in together. I think it really helps the reader never to get lost. Okay, but the thing is, once again, Morgan Stern breaks this pattern in book five, which is called The Owl King. The Owl King is not a book. It's not a way of storytelling. But by putting it in the middle of that pattern after a series of sections called Sweet Sorrows, Fortunes and Fables, and other titles of books, um, Morgan Stern really makes a reader go like, hmm, what does that mean? And then finally, when you get to book six, the last, one of the last sections in the book, and it's named for a character called Cat, you're like, oh my god, yes, because Cat has been established as a character throughout. Morgan Stern has been continually sort of reminding readers that she exists, 
um, but we haven't really gotten to see into her mind as much and it's just so exciting um, that from the outset of that book you know you're going to get to see into her mind finally um, and get her perspective on these events. And again, by using that title, um, which is, let me double check. Here we go, book six, The Secret Diary of Katrina Hawkins. That sounds so cool, right? But anyway, The Secret Diary of Katrina Hawkins. And again, Morgan Stern sets, sets you up for another change in the sort of format of storytelling, namely excerpts from this secret diary that Kat has been writing. By making sure that you're not confused about where these excerpts, these changes in storytelling are coming from, she really allows you to actually engage with the material, get excited about the material, and then be confused about some other things, like the symbolism or themes that actually matter, that you should be wondering about and thinking about and maybe being confused. So, Morgan Stern gets away with titles like this. A paper star that has been unfolded and refolded into a tiny unicorn, but the unicorn remembers a time when it was a star and an earlier time when it was part of a book. And sometimes the unicorn dreams of the time before it was a book when it was a tree and the time even longer before that when it was a different sort of star. Whew. So she gets away with titles like that, which usually I think you wouldn't see, um, or usually would not be considered a good title because titles are supposed to be short, they're supposed to be snappy, they're supposed to tell you exactly what's going on. But I think in this case it's actually describing something and now the reader has been seeing these, the the paper stars before and uh, throughout this section we've been getting a lot of sections that are called oh such and so written on a paper star. This is just one of the ways of storytelling encapsulated within the novel. So this isn't coming out of nowhere and I think that's really important, again, setting expectations. I think the other thing we can get from this is that it's not bad to describe things. Like this is a pretty in-depth description of the history of a paper star. And I think it just shows that it's not necessarily good if the reader is confused or unclear about where that's coming from. I think definitely when you're writing literary fiction, there's sometimes this perception that readers should be confused. Like it's only good, it's only literary if readers are confused. You can tell what I think about that. Um, but. This is one example of quite a literary book, a very beautifully written, very lyrical book, where the author still has really clear explanations and descriptions, again, of things where the reader shouldn't be confused. And it's so important that this isn't just some random literary ramble because the image of the paper stars has been introduced before. So talking about images, I think another really, really important thing that Maureen Cern does is that she establishes a few really clearly described images throughout the book that sort of give the reader like something to go on, a foundation um, for understanding everything when it comes together at the end. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but basically, she has a number of symbols, of images, of repeated motifs that she describes really, really, really clearly, really vividly. And I always felt that, like, from the outset, I knew what she was trying to describe and I knew that what I was imagining was what she wanted me to imagine. There are definitely some books where I'm, like, completely making it up, but this was not one of them. So, for example, the book Sweet Sorrows itself, uh, the painting of the, the pirates that are also bunnies, um, the paper stars, um, this character Max who dresses up as uh, the king of the wild things and she has pink hair, like all of these things are really really clearly described um, and again just set expectations really well and reserve confusion. One of these images that I particularly wanted to talk about was that of honey because honey shouldn't work. It's not unique, it's not like a folded paper star, it's not like a woman dressed as the king of the wild things with pink hair. It's very a very generic, very everyday item. So why does it work as such a distinctive and specific image? Well, I think basically um, how Maureen Stern pulls this off is that she strips Honey of all its usual associations, connotations, and contexts. Like it's no longer just this thing that you, you know, put a spoonful of in your tea. She gives us whole oceans of it. She It's basically the glue that binds everything in the novel together. That seems like it should be a pun somehow, I'm not sure how. Um, but it's this through line that runs throughout the book, both literally in the form of these honey oceans and figuratively, just as an image throughout the novel. And because it takes on all these new meanings, this new context, the reader 
gradually stops associating it with this everyday object of honey that we know and love and honey in the book basically becomes a whole new thing and so in that way um, Morgan Stern essentially creates a symbol out of something really humdrum and everyday. And so all of this consistency in the images means that when things start to come together at the end and tie together, it's really, really, really satisfying. And you never have to go back and be like, oh, what was that again? Like, who was that again? It's just all comes together. And because the foundation is already laid in your mind, you can just understand that and get it immediately. It clicks and it's really super satisfying, a great conclusion. I think that's yet another thing that's so important to do in these really long books where there's a lot of complex imagery and symbolism is to make sure that pe that people have really specific things to latch onto and they know what it is that you're talking about when you're talking about it. So I mentioned a couple times that Maureen Stern quote unquote gets away with a lot of sort of structural and stylistic things and I, I use that phrase purposefully because I think a lot of the things that she does go against the advice that writers are often given. And I wanted to look at how she does that a little bit. So one of the things that makes it possible is that she's very purposeful about these choices, but that can only take you so far. Um, and I think the other really important thing that she does is that she's very conscious of the genres that she's writing in and that she's invoking. And she ties all of these stylistic and structural choices to the genre. So basically making this connection between style and genre. And yet again, I think that's a really important thing for such a long book. So we'll start out with what I said about it being very purposeful. So I think she purposefully uses variety and what some might call inconsistency even. And that starts from the very, very beginning. Like she mixes styles, genres, um, narrators who show up once, maybe don't show up again. All of that starts out from the very beginning. So it doesn't come out of nowhere and hit you somewhere in the middle. And again, I think she's just setting expectations. And then to help out with this issue of the many multiple viewpoints and some of which, you know, are only there for a few chapters, um, I think she 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 pulls this off by making sure that one, some of the characters are really well established as characters before we even see their viewpoints. So even though we haven't heard their narration directly before, um, we already sort of know who they are. We have a foundation to start with and it feels really natural to slip into their viewpoint. And then I think for the others, a lot of them are characters in myths and fables. Um, and so at that point, even if we haven't been introduced to them before, we're sort of familiar from just like somewhere within our consciousness, we're familiar with these sort of character types. I think that's really important that it's not specific characters, but rather character types in some of these sections. Um, and so it's okay if the moon or if fate shows up a couple times and doesn't again because as readers in this like western tradition we're already sort of familiar with these figures. But I think Maureen Stern being purposeful about all of this obviously doesn't account for for all of the things that she gets away with and I think the more important thing is that she is really leveraging genre. And what I mean by that is sort of like I, w I would say this book is written in a fairy tale style, fairy tale mode, and there's a lot that you can get away with in a fairy tale or a fable or a myth. And in fact, a fairy tale wouldn't really be a fairy tale if it didn't have some of these things like a happy ending, um, a somewhat like idi idiosyncratic voice. And so I think that allows Morgan Stern to do a lot of things like what I would call underusing commas. So you can see this example. He loops down through the cavernous barroom to where he last saw her, but the wine cellar is unoccupied. I think that would technically be considered grammatically incorrect, but because it's within this sort of fairy tale mode, it's okay because it's part of that idiosyncratic voice. Another thing would be that Morgan Stern sort of overuses repetition or overuses in a in a usual sense. So for example, there were many paths once in a time that has passed, lost many miles and pages ago. Now there's only one path for Zachary Ezra Rollins to choose, the path that leads to the end. She uses the phrase the path a lot in that section. And not only that, she says, there were many paths once in a time that has passed, lost many miles and pages ago. Like all three of those clauses sort of mean the same thing. And if I were giving conventional writing advice, I would say, no, you don't want to repeat yourself three times. But again, because this is within sort of a fairy tale, Morgan Stern gets away with it. And then another thing is that she has a lot of really, really short paragraphs. Now, in fact, my dad was looking over my shoulder when I was reading and he asked me, 
why are all the lines weirdly indented? And I was like, those are just her paragraphs. Um, so I think, you know, she has all of these paragraphs that are one line or two lines. Um, and again, that would be something that um, I would usually point out and say, like, maybe you should have a variety of different lengths of paragraphs, but Maureen Stern mostly relies on these shorter paragraphs. I think not only does this tie into the fairy tale style, but it also really evokes like the really short lines in video games, which is another image that comes up again and again. I think this is so cool because she is tying together the images and motifs within the book um, and the things that are important within the book to the style itself, which is just really awesome. And then this last thing that she does, well, it's a big spoiler, so skip this part of the video. Um, I'll put the time that you should skip to um, if you don't want to get spoiled for this, if you haven't read it yet, but I think it's such an important part of the book and such a big no-no usually that I really wanted to talk about it here. So basically, if everybody skipped ahead, she kills her main character. Like, you're not supposed to do that. And I wanted to know why does that work? So basically, I think part of it is that she's already established a lot of other strong viewpoints who can carry the story, other characters who can carry along the story after Zachary's death. And another thing is that Zachary is killed by Dorian, but it feels like a logical progression of action for Dorian because we've already been told that, you know, he's going through this sort of like a psychological maze thing and he's gonna see a bunch of creatures that look like Zachary but aren't actually him and if he lets himself get seduced by them he's gonna die or whatever um, and so he has to kill all of these things that look like Zachary immediately before without even really considering or taking a closer look and so as soon as we're told that we're like oh my god he's gonna kill Zachary because how could you set that up without doing that again setting expectations um, but because of that readers aren't exactly surprised that Dorian ends up killing Zachary, the real Zachary. And another thing that's really important about this whole death thing is that it's appropriately, like, trippy. When Zachary dies, he goes into this, like, miniature constructed landscape with giant bees and, you know, trees made out of construction paper and water that's actually confetti. Um, and th But this setting has been talked about before. It's like this dollhouse landscape that we've come back to again and again throughout the book. So again, even the afterlife for Zachary doesn't come out of nowhere. So again, setting expectations, making sure readers aren't confused when we finally get into this doll landscape. And in fact, it's actually a really satisfying moment when you realize, oh, that's where he is. That's why this landscape is important. That's why Morgan Stern has been telling us about it again and again. So it actually becomes a really cool moment of connecting the dots for the reader as well. And then finally, I hate to say this, what makes it work is that Zachary isn't really dead. Like, he comes back to life, and you're probably thinking, like, doesn't that make it a thousand times worse? And again, usually, maybe it would. Like, don't kill your main characters, and especially don't kill them and then bring them back to life. That's the usual advice, I think. But in this case, how it happens is that Zachary's soul or his spirit has, like, a little adventure, and then meanwhile, Dorian is working to bring his body back to life by giving fate's heart to to Zachary. Fate's heart has been established. It's been an image that we've seen again and again throughout the book. And so it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not like Howl's Moving Castle I'm looking at you. It's not like that type of um, sort of deus ex machina where the main character just suddenly comes back to life. Um, and also going back to the idea that this is all in the fairy tale style, um, it's okay for the fairy tale to have a happy ending where everybody survives and they all live happily ever after. That's expected. And so it's not as egregious that Morgan Stern kills her main character and then brings him back. That just makes it work a little bit better within the format of the, story, of the fairy tale. So to wrap it up, I just wanted to pull out a couple of phrases that I thought were really excellent in the book that I really enjoyed reading. And I think I won't say that this book was perfect, but I did enjoy it a great deal, and not just for what I learned about writing from it, but just from a lot of Maureen Stern's turns of phrase that I thought were really good. So the first one, this is a bit of a joke, I guess, but like, Kat, Zachary's friend, describes him as orientationally unavailable. He's gay. That that means he's gay. Um, and I swear to God, I will find some way to use that phrase and apply it to myself. I know I'm bi, I know this doesn't really apply, but I will find some way to do it, because I love that. One other one, take a look at this passage here. This hidden kingdom was underground and had a seaport if I'm remember remembering it right. 
I probably did because it was on something called the Starless Sea, and I know I'm not misremembering that part because it was definitely underground, thus the no stars. Unless that whole part was a metaphor. Whatever. This is Kat writing in her diary, and it just makes me think, what if it was a metaphor all along? Okay, so there you have it, the things that I learned about writing from Erin Morgenstern's The Starless Sea. I think all of the things that I talked about today are particularly useful for writing long books like this is, but I feel like it just goes to show you can still break rules, even in long books. You just have to be really purposeful about it and set readers' expectations, and again, the theme that keeps coming up again and again, reserving confusion. So I'd love to hear from you. If you've read the book, what are some things that you've learned from it? Or even what were some things that you liked, didn't like, thought that she did well or poorly? Um, comment down below. Uh, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video was as interesting and cool for you to watch as it was for me to make it. And I'll see you next time. Be safe, be well, bye.